good evening and welcome to Harvest Baptist Church. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's just muscle memory. Good evening and welcome to Harvest Baptist Church. Welcome to our Sunday night service. So thankful you're all here with us tonight. Those who are joining us uh, here and those watching online. Uh, we're privileged to have Brother Daniel Charland with us here tonight. We're looking forward to the message he's going to bring us from God's Word. But first we're going to sing a couple songs. This song's found on page 413, and you can't sing the song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, Sitting Down. So let's stand up, page number 413. We'll sing it out. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Soldiers of the cross, lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. Victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet's call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor and watching unto prayer. Where duty calls for danger, be never wanting there. Amen. And how is the world treating you today? Probably not very good, but Jesus will treat you good. Amen. Amen. Just make a note here tonight that if you can't see the screen, you probably want to move where you can. In the center part, because those in behind can't see over your head. I think it works all right where they are now. I know Linda and, and uh, Fred. <laughs> I, I just give up. It's just got to be Fred. He, came, he claims it's Floyd, but I think he's probably mistaken. If, he checked, if you go back and check that birth certificate for me. Because every time I think of him, I think of Fred instead of Floyd. But anyway, you might have to move over a little bit, but if you can, that's fine. Just get a place so you can see uh, his equipment doesn't match with the church's equipment, and so he's, we've got to use his equipment tonight, so that's why everything's a little bit different. I'm glad to see a good number out this evening, and I'm expecting God to give us a great blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, tonight we are thankful for your grace and your tender mercies. Father, we're thankful for the group that have come out this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would bless them and give them the, the needs of their heart and their soul that they might walk closer to you. Lord, help us to be alert for the weapon that Satan uses against us. Father, we just pray tonight for those that uh, are here and Lord, for those that can't be here and the Lord, for those who may be uh, watching tonight on the streaming uh, services. I pray, Lord, that you give grace and bring glory and honor to your name. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated if you like. Amen. Just a couple quick announcements. Don't forget uh, Graduation Sunday, which is next Sunday night. Uh, we're honoring our two high school graduates, Vanessa Leone uh, and Jacob Laram. Uh, so make sure you're here next Sunday night. After the services, we'll have a potluck across the street. So if you could help us out, uh, bring a dish enough for you and your family, maybe a couple other people, just to make sure we have plenty of food. Uh, we'll have a couple tables set up across the street for our graduates. We'll have a box there. Uh, you can put a card in there, uh, a note of encouragement, uh, maybe even a gift the Lord lays it on your heart. So that's next Sunday night after the evening service. Uh, officers... 
uh, pastor would like to meet with you uh, tonight right after the services. Uh, so all the officers, please go to uh, pastor's office after the, the end of this service tonight. Uh, and we also would like your help in cleaning uh, the church. We have the funeral tomorrow afternoon. Uh, if you could help me out by, we can just get the auditorium vacuumed, uh, the back bathrooms cleaned, and the hallway swept. Uh, it would be a big blessing to me. So if you could help me out uh, right after services, just stick around. Uh, I'll give you a job. I've gotten really good at using a toilet brush, and I'm, really, I'm ready to pass it on to someone else. So uh, if you'd like to help us tonight, just stick around right after church, and we'll get you uh, cleaning something. Page number 409. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the air. There is a spiritual war going on tonight, and this song says, the fight is on. So let's stand up. We're going to sing it out. Page number 409. The fight is on. The trumpet sound is ringing out. The fight is on. The trumpet sound is ringing out. The cry to arms is heard afar and near. The Lord of hosts is marching on to victory. The triumph of the Christ will soon appear. The fight is on, O oh Christian soldier, and face to face in stern array. With armor gleaming and color streaming, the right and wrong engage today. The fight is on, but be not weary. Be strong and in his might hold fast. If God be for us, his banner o'er us, we'll sing the victor song at last. The fight is on, arouse ye soldiers brave and true. Jehovah leads and victory will assure. Go buckle on, the armor God has given you and in his strength forever will endure. The fight is on, O oh Christian soldier, and face to face in stern array. With armor gleaming, and color streaming, the right and wrong engage today. The fight is on, but be not weary. Be strong and in his might hold fast. If God be for us, his banner o'er us, we'll sing the victor song at last. Oh, if you're in the Lord's army, sing it out. Verse number three. The fight is leading on to certain victory. The bow of promise spans the eastern sky. His glorious name in every land shall honored be. The dawn will break. Peace is nigh. The fight is on, no Christian soldier. And face to face in stern array. With armor gleaming, and color streaming, the right and wrong engage today. The fight is on, but be not weary. Be strong and in his might hold fast. If God be for us, his banner o'er us, we'll sing the victor song at last. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Hey. But the, the trumpet and the trombone sounded good. How many of you are feeling pretty good tonight? If, you're, if you feel like you can, would you work real hard and say, Amen? Amen. Well, that's not bad for a Methodist, Amen. <laughs> if you're a Baptist tonight, say Amen. amen. See what I told you? There makes a difference, doesn't it? Well, tonight we have Brother Daniel Charlin. Uh, he has a, a ministry that he travels from church to church with. He's, I guess you're an evangelist then, aren't you? Well, we're really missionaries confirming the churches. Okay, he's a missionary confirming the churches. And so tonight he's going to give a presentation here, as you can see, the introduction to devilism, Satan's deceptions, and the family, government, and churches. And so we'll shut these lights off up here, Doug, if we can, 
straight above us. Maybe that will make it a little bit brighter for you. If we have to, we'll cut some other lights down to you. So, all right? Are you ready? Yes. <sighs> Who said yes? <laughs> the Baptist word is amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. See, I got my wife trained anyway. And uh, those of you, just, just in case you forgot, our offering plate is still over there as you come and go. Uh, you can fill that up. You know, I love to walk by the offering plate and see it heaped up and running over. I've had a dream uh, since about 1968, maybe 65, of using a wharf stub to take the offering up in and filling it. Not just use the wash tub. But wouldn't that be marvelous if God would bless us so that we could just use the, the wash tub? I, I think that would be, I think that would be a beautiful offering plate, don't you? Now you have to just lay that aside. He's a Baptist preacher. He's always thinking about offering. God bless you. Would you do something here? <laughs> <coughs> Good evening. Is my mic wired up high here so you can hear me really well? Praise the Lord. Well, we want to thank Brother Mex for having us back. We were here three years ago and did another PowerPoint presentation called American Christian Heritage and the Way Things Are Today. How many of you remember that? Praise the Lord, and you came back anyways. All right. And then in 2014, we did our Living History presentation for you. So it's, it's an honor to be back, and, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Just a little quick background about us, Dan and Charlotte Ministries, my wife Jennifer and me. Jennifer had a very bad migraine. You may recall she has some health issues, so please pray for her. Uh, she's starting to feel a little bit better today, but traveling 340 miles with a three-day migraine is not a good thing. So, but our, son, our oldest son, Joseph, is with us, and uh, so it was a blessing for him to come and help me load everything in and out of the churches. We are missionaries to the United States sent by Calvary Baptist Church in Essex Junction, Vermont. In September 2013, we stepped out in faith with no monthly support. And Paul Cornelius is the man who challenges us to do that. And he mentored me the first couple of years of our ministry. I love that man, and I'm going to miss him. And when I, after I see Jesus, his is going to be one of the first faces I'll look for. So I quit my secular job, resigned from the interim pastor I held for a year and a half, and we sold our house in four days. From 2013 to 2019, our three sons worked with us in the ministry. This is them back in 2013, little guys. And they worked with us through 2018, and they all grew up. Joseph just finished his first year of Bible college. But God has provided for the work through the generous giving of churches and individuals who love Christ and love America. We've ministered in hundreds of churches all over the United States. We've ministered in dozens of schools, and to date we've seen 1,200 people come to Christ. So God has blessed our work, and we give him all the glory and honor for that. We are equipping the saints, educating Christians about America's Christian heritage and the resulting Christian consensus, helping Christians understand how America lost that Christian consensus, and explaining the proper Christian response. In case you haven't noticed, especially the last three or four years, our country is going crazy. This presentation I will help, uh, help you to understand that a lot, a lot better, why it's happening. We do living history presentations, and if you go to our website, you can see all those listed. And we do our PowerPoint presentations, and again, on our website, you can see all those listed. So please pray for our ministry and family. Please take a prayer card on the table up front before you leave. We covet your prayers. You can sign up for our newsletter. There's a sign-up form there. You can also sign up for it on our, on our website. And... Uh, so that's a little bit about us. We'll get into the message here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as I approach your throne in grace, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Father, I thank you for the blood of Christ. I thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And Father, I pray your blessing and anointing upon this hour. Keep Satan at bay. I pray for hearts to be yielded tonight, seeds planted and watered. I pray if there's anybody here tonight who does not know Christ as their Savior, tonight will be the night that they receive him. And those of us who are Christians, Lord, use this message to prick our hearts, to be more yielded, to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for our nation, Father. I pray that you'll, you'll move in, in miraculous ways so you can once again bless, bless America, Lord. 
I pray for our politicians, from the president down to the local politicians. I pray for our judges, from the Supreme Court justices down to local judges. I pray for all those serving in government offices, jobs, and positions, Father. I pray these will all rule and reign in a biblical fashion, promoting godly morality, laws, and policies. And those who aren't doing that, Father, I pray they will repent and be saved. And Father, if they will do neither, I ask you to smite them and remove them from public office. I pray for the righteous to be in authority and the wicked to be thrust down. Father, I pray for a third great awakening in America. I pray for the lost to repent, be saved, and the saved to repent, get right. Father, I ask you to use our ministry to do that and use this church to do that, Father. We love you, we thank you, and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So this message is titled, Introduction to Devilism, Satan's Deceptions in the Family, Government, and Churches. By the way, those are the three institutions ordained of God. God ordained three institutions, family, husband, wife, and children, male and female. In the government, the purpose of government is to preserve life, liberty, and property, and in America, we the people are the government. In the church, Christ is the head, the Bible, God's word, and pastor is the shepherd. But Satan has implemented the devilisms to destroy these three institutions. Now, relativism is the root of all devilisms. Relative truth undergirds all the other devilisms. It is the root of the corrupt tree. Relative truth is the result of man rejecting God's word as absolute truth. Ladies and gentlemen, God's word is absolute truth. Absolute truth is unchangeable. In other words, in God's economy, A is A. Does that make sense? B, C, and D will never be A. What God said we can trust, the truth will never change, but this is not the case with relative truth. You see, with relative truth, society or the elites in government determine good and evil, right and wrong. It not only changes over time, but contradictions occur very frequently. It might have you looking like this. Hermann Goring, Hitler's Luftwaffe commander, stated, if the fear declares two times two is five, then two times two is five. In the Nazi land of relative truth, Jews were thus declared non-persons under German law. This led to six million Jews legally killed in concentration camps, along with six million others, including many Christians and gypsies. They were legally killed because under relative truth, they decreed Jews to be non-persons. So therefore, they didn't murder anybody. But God's word condemns relative truth. Divers' weights and divers' measures, both of them are alike abominations to the Lord. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5.20 is the text that shows God's heart on relative truth. God hates relative truth. Can you think of a modern example Here's Bruce Jenner in 1981. Here he is in 2014. He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Can you think of a modern example? Here's Bill Clinton. Guilty, but he gets a free pass. Here's Brett Kavanaugh, innocent, but crucified. Truth is what they want you to, they want you to believe truth is what they say it is. In essence, relative truth can be summed up by this simple equation. And I tried to pick a picture that even a child can understand. Relative truth is lying. Amen. By the way, I just want you to know this this presentation tonight, thirty or forty years ago in a Baptist church, would have been completely non controversial. But now, even in Baptist churches, some of what I'm going to tell you tonight, which is historically accurate and biblically factual, some people will, be get, will get upset about it. A recent poll by Barna demonstrated that only around 50% of Baptist pastors subscribe to a biblical worldview. And we wonder why our churches are in such a mess, which is why our country is in such a mess. I just want to point that out. As I go through this presentation tonight, there may be some people, oh. but again, 30 or 40 years ago, nobody would have disagreed with anything. 
Now, God's word has a lot to say about lying and liars. Thou shalt not bear false witness, the ninth commandment. Unless drastic measures to reduce greenhouse gases are taken within the next 10 years, the world will reach a point of no return. That was Al Gore in January 2006. Now AOC, the Socialist in Congress, is warning us we have 12 years to live if we don't implement their Green New Deal. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God does not like lying. Because he is a God of truth. Remember, relative truth is really about lying. All the other devilisms grow from the rotten root of relative truth. In other words, all devilisms are based on lies. Satan uses these lies to corrupt and destroy families, the government, and churches. So there's the rotten root. Using a tree root system, let's arrange the devilisms in a simple chart. We're only going to show basic relationships. Now, it may look overwhelming, but we're going to cut it into little pieces. But you'll see we have the root then the main trunk, the three main branches, and then other branches that come off of it. The first one we're going to look at, the main, after the trunk, after the root is the, the trunk, secular humanism. This is the belief that man is the highest form of being or animal, as they would perceive it. There is no God, and man determines good and evil, right and wrong. This is secular humanism. Okay? This, by the way, is the official philosophy of our public education system, as well as relative truth. So there is no God to save us and no afterlife. Man must build heaven on earth for the here and now and share all resources. Okay, this is what they believe. Secular humanism can be traced back to Eden, but it got a jump start in the 16th century. 16th century author Thomas More wrote a novel called Utopia. Ever heard that term, Utopia? It's what they use, the word, the word they use to describe heaven on earth apart from God. There is no room for God in their equation. They really believe that mankind can usher in a heaven on earth. In the novel, Moore promoted humanist communist principles. Moore was a Roman Catholic who despised the Protestant Reformation. He influenced Robert Owen, who established communistic communities in the early 19th century. With, with Owen, however, all the religious trapping left in Utopia by Moore were removed. He was completely secular. In his colonies, everything was considered public property, no private ownership. By the way, New Harmony, Indiana, in the 1820s, was one of his little socialistic trials. Marriages were condemned in exchange for free love. So when you joined his little communist commune, everyone had access to your wife. Sloth, elitism, and sexual promiscuity were common. Secular humanists want to bring Robert Owen's vision to fruition on a worldwide scale. Remember, since there is no God, and man is the highest being on earth, it is up to man to bring peace on earth, save the environment, build a one world government, and ensure everyone is equal. One of my favorite shows as a kid. And I had no idea the deep secular humanism they were promoting in that show. Now, if you go back and watch it again, keep these things in mind. It'll stand out like a sore thumb. Those who embrace biblical principles will oppose secular humanist ideals, but those opposed must be stopped. This is why Christians are so persecuted in communist nations like North Korea and China. This is actually a, a, one of the few prisoners that survived the North Korean prison camp drew a sketch of what was happening to the prisoners. Secular humanism leads to evil government like North Korea. So what does the Bible say? Well, the entire Bible testifies to the reality of God and the consequences for sin, and sin is a transgression of God's laws. Secular humanism leads to other devilisms. 
like evolutionism, egalitarianism, and moral relativism. So now we see the branches coming off the trunks. Looking at evolutionism, Brother Paul's expertise, the universe and man evolved. Nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. I want you to think about that equation. They mock us for saying, in the beginning, God. The next time somebody mocks you for, for believing that, ask, th ask them if they know what they believe. Because most of them don't really know what they believe. You have to tell them. So give them their equation. I believe in the beginning, God. You believe nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. And they say, we need to have faith. It's a seemingly scientific answer enabling the rejection of God in the Bible. Evolutionism has been promoted through the public education system for over 60 years. American school children, ladies and gentlemen, are taught to disbelieve the Bible. And don't think an hour in Sunday school is going to undo everything they get in public education. Many churches today now embrace evolution, including the Catholic Church and many Protestant denominations. And by the way, Baptists are not Protestants. So what does God's word say? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Pretty simple. By the way, one thing you'll notice is that in God's economy, truth is easy. It's simple. But in Satan's economy, it's very complex and hard to understand. By the way, the geologic record proves creation. I encourage you to watch Brother Kent Hovind's YouTube creation seminars to learn the truth. Secular humanism leads to other devilisms. We mentioned evolutionism. Now we'll look at egalitarianism. With egalitarianism, in order for life to be fair, everyone must be equal. Full equality of sexes, full equality of incomes, full equality in all things. The dangers of this devilism will be more clear when we learn later of its various offspring. So what does God's word say? All men are created in God's image, or spiritual likeness, but each is unique in our appearance, our talents and abilities, and our motivation and desire to obey God's word. Clearly in God's design, not everyone is equal in every way. The only way to move towards that goal, by the way, is through use of force. Gay marriage laws force people to legally recognize same-sex marriages. That's an example of that. Now let's look at moral relativism. With moral relativism, since there are no absolute truths, then there are no moral absolutes. Man decides what is morally acceptable based on societal standards. If it feels good, do it. How many remember that? How many hippies do we have here? Former hippies, right? Don't knock it till you try it. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Or one of the more recent ones on advertising for a certain city in Nevada. Can you remember that new one? Huh? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Good. We, at least we had one guy that went. Okay. <laughs> but it, that is all this moral relativism. Each culture is allowed to determine right and wrong. The headhunters or the cannibals in South America, they were not wrong. That was their culture. Now, you might feel differently if you were standing in the lunch line. So, according to them, we have no right to judge others. How many of you have heard people tell Christians this? They try to throw the Bible in our face. Judge not, lest you be judged. What does God's word say? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge ye righteous judgment. God never tells us not to judge. He says, judge righteous judgment. In other words, God doesn't want you going around spewing your opinion. He wants you to proclaim his word. Judge righteous judgment. Here's a guy that just sawed his daughter in half. Now, if, if I judge according to appearance, I might call social services up, right? <laughs> hey, this guy just cut his daughter in half. But do not judge according to the appearance. Judge righteous judgment. She's smiling and kicking her legs. She's probably okay. Judge not that you be not judged, and that's where they stop. But go on and read the rest. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, ye, it shall be measured to you again. Okay? In other words, we cannot judge by our hearts, but according to God's measuring tape. Amen? That's what that passage is telling us. 
It's not telling us not to judge. It's telling us to judge righteously. God does expect us to make judgments all the time. But we are not to judge based on our own relative standards, but by God's word, absolute truth. God expects us to use his word to make wise judgments when selecting a spouse, a church, a job, etc. Let me ask you a question. How many of you made a wise judgment when you chose your spouse? Uh-oh. <laughs> some, some, people are <laughs> so, <laughs> so, some people are in big trouble tonight. Now, it wasn't supposed to be a trick question, folks. <clears throat> this man has to make a judgment. Okay, he's going to pick a wife. Is it going to be this beautiful, dark, mysterious woman? Or is it going to be this lady holding up a Bible between her and potential suitors? He has to make a judgment, does he not? So to sum up, secular humanism it leads to other devilisms, including evolutionism, egalitarianism, and moral relativism. Now we're going to look at the branches that come off of these main branches. We're going to cut the tree down and view it on its side so we go left to right. So here's egalitarianism. Remember, all things have to be equal. These are the various devilisms that spring forth from egalitarianism. See, one thing leads to another. Okay. Marxism. Karl Marx, German philosopher, economist, historian, socialist theorist, or excuse me, political theorist, socialist, journalist, and revolutionary socialist. If you study Marx, you'll learn he was very busy doing everything except working. He promoted collectivism. Individuals have no rights, only the collective, the group, or the state matters. See, you and I have no rights, and we don't matter. You fit into the collective, you do what you're told, or will they eliminate you? Each person exists to serve the collective. Resources must be shared equally. Okay, Marxism leads to a couple of other devilisms, including communism, usually introduced by force, like the Soviet Union, Communist China, North Korea, Cuba, etc. This is a picture of the Czechoslovakians probably on their way to work the day after the Soviet Union invaded. Welcome to your new reality. With, Mark, with communism, there's full state control and ownership over everything and everyone. Political opponents are killed or sent to labor camps. They don't mess around. Religion, especially Christianity, is forbidden. With communism, the state is God. Besides the use of force, communism can also be introduced gradually to socialism. Eventually, socialism will lead to communism. And that's not my opinion. That's what Karl Marx said. That's what Lenin said. That's what most of these Marxists said. With socialism, there is some private ownership, but with full state control. Private property is limited with state control over education, health care, industry, etc. Via democracy, oddly enough, people vote to become socialists by degrees, little by little. Why would anybody do that? Because they're miseducated in public schools. America has been becoming socialist for over 100 years. Socialists in America were called progressives in the early 20th century. Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican, was a progressive, as was Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, both progressives. By the way, I actually have a two-part presentation on Marxism because it's such a real and critical danger to American society. You would be utterly amazed at how they've infiltrated every single institution in our country, every single one. So much so, it took two hours for me to do the presentation. I can only skim over the surface here. Socialism was kicked into high gear by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. His New Deal was a host of socialist programs thrust onto the American people during the Great Depression. Through the New Deal, the federal government took control of electrical power, production and distribution, industry, agriculture, communications, and labor. Let me ask you, when the government starts to take control of these types of things, do they ever relinquish control? No. Since the 1930s, government control over the economy in virtually every area of our lives has grown immensely. In 2010, Obamacare was passed by Congress mandating the purchase of health care, the government telling you what you have to buy, and penalizing you if you didn't buy it. 
Socialists love to promote their fairness programs during times of economic hardship when the people are most susceptible to their rhetoric. Let me ask you a question. Is our economy driving people to a point where they might become more desperate? Huh? We do not have an incompetent administration in Washington, D.C., ladies and gentlemen. Okay? We have, an, we have an organization throughout our government that is deliberately hijacking our economy and driving it into the ground. It is not incompetence. It is intentional, deliberate sabotage. Why? Because this is when they can get people to vote for their rhetoric. People give up essential liberty in exchange for the safety, so-called, of government handouts. Benjamin Franklin said, they who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Our education system has been promoting socialism over capitalism or free markets for many decades. 44% of millennials would rather live in a socialist state, 7% would rather live in a communist country. In case you, you're not good in math, that's over half. So when these people become voting age, guess, guess who they're going to start voting into office? Remember I told you people become socialist by democracy? Socialism always leads to a lower standard of living and far less liberty. How many of you are better off now than you were a year and a half ago? Not even one. I know I had to drive 340 miles to get here. I paid four, almost four and a half dollars a gallon for gas in my Chevy Suburban. Joe was going to let me use his Dodge Grand Caravan, which gets 10 miles more to the gallon, but we developed a, uh, a coolant leak. And I really didn't want to be 300 miles from home and have a head gasket blow on me. So we took the Suburban. Okay? Our costs for our ministry have skyrocketed. It's, it's been hurting our family a great deal. But this is all by design. Satan is behind all of this. And he hasn't liked me since I started this ministry. I don't know why. But he's still after me. Brother Paul told me, Brother Dan, if you wouldn't soul, I promise you two things. He said, guarantee you two things. If you wouldn't soul us for Christ, number one, God's going to take care of you. And number two, Satan's going to come after you. Truer words were never spoken. Socialist policies create economic crisis. Then the socialists claim to have the answer to the very crisis they created. I mean, imagine hiring some guy to fix your house, and when you come home from work, it's in shambles. I thought you were going to fix it. Well, Mr. Smith, actually, I just need another $30,000. Would you give it to him? That's what we're doing with our government. Politicians in America today are openly promoting socialism, including Bernie Sanders and AOC. Socialism and communism are forms of government-sanctioned stealing. What does God's word say about that? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's God's welfare program, folks. And when we used to go by it, it worked great. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Whilest it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? You go to Acts chapter 5, read about Ananias and Sapphira claiming they sold their property for such and such because they wanted to be famous in their church, you know, and they lied about how much they sold the house for. Peter's point, Peter's point to, to Ananias was, hey, look, you didn't have to lie about it. When it, was your, when it was in your possession, it was yours to do what you wanted with. That's just one of many places in the Bible where God decrees we have a right to private property. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Matthew 20, 15, that's the parable that Jesus was talking about where the guy pays a guy a talent for an hour's worth of work and a guy that worked all day got the same thing. And the guys that worked all day criticized him for being generous to the guys that worked an hour. And his response was, hey, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? It's my money, I can do what I want with it, right? Well, guess what? We have minimum wage laws in America that deny men this right. If you're an employer, you don't have a right to pay what you want. The government tells you what you have to pay. 
But whether you are a laborer or an employer, your property is your own by God's decree. In God's economy, charity is encouraged, but it is only charity if it is by one's own free will. Taking by force is stealing. In other words, folks, this is good. Can you see that? Salvation Army? Ding, 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 right? This is not good. Communists with machine guns. Multiculturalism. This is the teaching out of egalitarianism that all cultures are of equal value. We have no right to judge other cultures or to declare them wrong. Remember what we said about the South American headhunters. This runs contrary to the Bible. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Brother, that's exclusive. Amen? If you have never repented of your rebellion against God's laws and trusted Christ as your personal Savior from sin, then you will go to hell when you die. Multiculturalism defies common sense. The 17th century Christian English settlers in North America found the heathen Indian culture shocking. Here are some facts about American Indians, many of which I learned, by the way, from an Abnaki shaman who taught my Native American class when I was going to teacher's college at Johnson State College. You know what a shaman is? It's a medicine man. A medicine man taught me Native American history. And he gave me more facts than I've ever heard in the media. He told it like it was. I, w I almost fell over. I went in that class thinking, this is going to stink. I got to listen to all this politically correct garbage for a semester. And first day of class, he's, he got up and started nailing it. I was like, I, I like this guy. American Indians were constantly at war with each other. They practiced torture of prisoners. In fact, their children were, ta were taught to cut off the fingers of captives. I have all these documented accounts, all the, you know, all the stuff was written about. This is well-documented do documented stuff. They practiced cannibalism in some tribes. They believed that they tortured you to death and you didn't scream and you died without screaming, that you were a brave enemy and they would cut out your heart and eat it so they can get your bravery. So when you read these old accounts of the Europeans calling the Indians heathen and barbaric, they were. But it's all taken out of context, twisted around, and the Europeans are made to be the evil ones. And the Indians are made to be these spiritual great people. Of course, they were polytheistic, worshipped many gods. They were pantheistic, they believed God was in everything. But these facts were actually mentioned in public school textbooks through the early 20th century. But due to multiculturalism, these facts were removed, and the colonists have been made to be the evil ones, while the Indians are portrayed as sensitive environmentalists who love peace. And then the white man came and ruined it all. Ultimately, listen, multiculturalism will lead to an American culture condemning Christianity for its exclusivity and absolute standards of right and wrong, and we're seeing that play out today. If you stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, and that's sin, they want to kill you now. It's getting to that point. Anti-Christian bigotry is already on the rise in America. Some recent headlines. Bus company yanks Franklin Graham religious ads. Campus senator labeled homophobic for speaking her faith. Courthouse cafe owners face eviction for playing Christian music. <clears throat> CrossFit fires Christian employee over religious beliefs. Town orders family to stop hosting Bible studies on farm. And incoming Muslim congresswomen mock Pence's Christian faith. Of course, these are a few years old. I, I have hundreds of articles. Hundreds of articles. Feminism. Feminism attempts to make women equal with men in every way. In America, this started with women's suffrage, the push for the right to vote in the 19th century. Early feminists in America were often affiliated with Protestant Christianity. Others, like Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, were secular and radical in their intentions. Margaret Sanger promoted eugenics. She wanted selective breeding to weed out bad races. She was a very racist woman. She couldn't stand African Americans. And by the way, most of the abortion centers you'll find are in African-American communities. She promoted 
non-value sex education, birth control, and free love. She herself was an adulteress. The modern feminist movement was launched by Betty Friedan with her 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique. In the book, she makes the case that true fulfillment for women is not to be found in marriage and child rearing. Where would any woman get the idea that she could be fulfilled in marriage and child rearing? The Word of God. In 1966, Frieden helped found the National Organization for Women, now demanded true equality for all women. In 1971, they passed a declaration promoting equal rights for lesbians. And in 1971, they started assisting lesbian mothers in child custody cases. Here is a typical feminist couple. Now, I guarantee you that child didn't come from a union between those two individuals. The role of women has changed much since the 1950s, thanks to feminism. Here's a 1950s saved wife. Here's a 1950s unsaved wife. See any difference? Huh? Thanks to the Christian consensus, they're the same. I was raised in a Catholic family. My family didn't even know the gospel. And my mom stayed home. Until we were, actually when we went to school, she got a job at the elementary school working in the lunch line. So after we got on the bus, she went to work, and she was home before we got home. So as far as we were concerned, she never left the house. Here's a 2020's unsaved wife. Here's a 2020's saved wife. Christians followed the lost women into the workforce. The feminist agenda has led to the breakdown of the family in America. It aligns perfectly with the objectives of Marxist nations that want to replace the traditional family with the state. The former Soviet Union implemented the same types of policies in the early 20th century. Out of wedlock births were encouraged. Divorce was common. And women worked while their children were raised in government daycare. By the way, Marx in his Communist Manifesto he said that women should work outside the home and government employees would go in and clean the house. The breakdown of the family enabled the Soviet Union to indoctrinate children in public schools and they were considered state property. How has the family fared since Christians embraced feminist ideals? <clears throat> since the 1960s, 30 to 60 percent of married Americans commit adultery. Divorce is up 350%. Criminal arrest of teens is up 150%. Teen suicides are up 450%. And child abuse is up 2,300%. Are we a better country for having followed the feminists? Are we a better country for having embraced Marxist ideology and rejecting biblical ideals? Now let's look at another devilism here. <clears throat> we looked at egalitarianism. Now we'll look at moral relativism. And we'll cut the tree down and view it on its side. Moral, we've already looked at uh, feminism, but moral relativism leads to hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure and material goods as the primary goal of life. While God gave us many things for our pleasure, pleasure itself is not to be the overriding goal of our lives. God intends that we love him and share Christ's love with others. Hedonism has been around since Eden, and history demonstrates man's propensity to choose pleasure over obedience to God. God's word gives us laws to steer us away from fleshly desires, the Ten Commandments, for example. Apart from God, however, as with secular humanism, man has no reason to refrain from pursuing a hedonistic existence. In America, the devilisms all work together to bring us the sexual revolution of the 1960s. One of the founding fathers of the sexual revolution was Hugh Hefner, who launched Playboy magazine in December 1953. Sometimes, even as an historian, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. 1953? And here's the first Playboy cover. Anybody recognize that gal? Marilyn Monroe. Playboy opened the door to legitimizing pornography. In fact, in this scene from The Lucky Letter, Andy finds Barney's pornographic magazine at the dump. This is from the Andy Griffith Show in 1965. Now, we, my family loves the Andy Griffith Show. We watch it all the time. This is one of those episodes where I just kind of go, oh, 
Why did they do that? Why did they do that? But this shows you how it had infiltrated even a, a program like that. Hedonism has impacted America's clothing, our behavior, our entertainment, and our overall culture. Here's a couple of college gals just saying hi. Transgenderism. Hedonism leads to transgenderism. We mentioned Bruce Jenner previously. Jenner confirmed rumors on April 24, 2015, telling Diane Sawyer he has the soul of a woman, that he will remain dad to his kids, but that from, now, from here on out, he is no longer Bruce Jenner, but her. See, pronouns, after all, are very important to the transgender community. Here's Angela Ponce, the 2018 Miss Universe Spain pageant winner. He or she. Anybody want to guess? That's a man. Now, he's prettier than a lot of gals, I know. Let's <laughs> but that is a man. Nancy Pelosi is promoting legislation called the Equality Act to protect transgenders. To protect them from what? Have you heard of Christians going around stoning transgenders? What would this Equality Act do? The Equality Act would, number one, penalize Americans who don't affirm the new sexual norms or gender ideology. So, that, Brother Dan, that's just your opinion. The Act hasn't passed yet. Oh, yeah? Since the gay marriage laws were passed, Christian florists, bakers, photographers, wedding venue owners, videographers, web designers, calligraphers, and public servants have all been prosecuted under gay marriage laws. It would compel certain speech. In other words, it would force you to say certain things you don't want to say. A Virginia high school teacher was fired for refusing to call a transgender female student he and him. And this was under a school board policy. What, we, what will happen when this becomes a federal law? It would shut down charities. Under gay marriage laws, Catholic adoption agencies have been denied the right to operate in many cities due to their insistence that children be placed in traditional families. It would allow biological males to defeat girls in sports. Already top female athletes have lost to transgenders in competitions and many girls have been injured in sports by transgenders. It would coerce medical professionals. Under state laws, transgenders have sued Catholic hospitals in California and New Jersey for declining to perform hysterectomies on otherwise healthy women who wanted to pursue gender transition. And it would lead to parents losing custody of their children. Remember we said in the, in the communist societies, who do the children belong to? The state. Well, that would never happen in America. In Ohio, a judge removed a biological girl from her parents' custody after they declined to help her transition to male with testosterone supplements. The state took the child away. Who do your kids really belong to? It would enable sexual assault. The proposed Equality Act would, could impose a nationwide bathroom policy that would leave women and children vulnerable to predators, men legally using women's restrooms. We've already seen rashes of that all over the country with Target's new policies. What does God's Word say? Now this is profound, so get ready for this. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And in case you need a, a pictorial, there you go. And in case you're still confused, that's the man with the pants on, and that's the girl with the dress on, okay? Amen. <laughs> now you have a basic understanding of the devilism, Satan's deceptions in the family, government, and churches. What can Christians do about the spread of devilisms in America? First, ask yourself, how many of these devilisms have crept into my life or family? This is why Christians no longer impact the culture for Christ. We're like they are. But here's the proper Christian response. Yield your life to Christ so you can be empowered to live for him. You do not have the power to live the Christian life. I promise you that. Okay? You will fall flat on your face every time. I used to be a professional backslider. You know what a professional is? Somebody gets paid for what they do. And I got paid for being a backslider, I'll tell you. Okay? Okay? When I realized that I couldn't live the Christian life, I had to yield my life to Jesus Christ, that's when I f suddenly found the power because he lived the Christian life through me. 
And you can't be a hoop jumper if you yielded to Christ. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove as that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Are you yielded tonight? Are you, Christian, yielded to Christ? If he asked you to be a pastor, gentlemen, would you surrender and go into the ministry? If he asked your family to go to Africa, would you go? If he asked you to sell your big house and buy a smaller house and invest the difference in, in, in a world evangelism, would you do that? What are you holding back from Christ? If, if, if there's anything, you're not yielded. You're just not yielded. Second, we need to spread the gospel. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And third, support mission work at home and abroad. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The God of Pentecost is the God of today, folks. If 2 Chronicles 7, 14 really applies here. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, not the homosexual, not your transgender, if my people will turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Amen. We have the power, do we have the will? If you have never been saved, you need to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Good works and religion cannot save anyone. Christ alone is the answer to our sin problem. So here is the gospel. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, folks. And 1 John 3.4 tells us what sin is. It's a transgression of God's law. 613 precepts in the Old Testament law. But even the most unreligious person is familiar with the top ten. What do we call them? Ten Commandments. You know, the first four deal with our relationship with God, and the last six deal with our relationship with each other. Thou shalt know the gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Our relationship with God. Now our relationship with each other. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. We have all violated these commands. The problem with that is the wages of sin is death. Because you're a sinner, you violated those Ten Commandments. The consequence for you is death. And what is that? Death in the Bible means separation. Physical death is when the spirit and soul of a man separates from his body. That's physical death. The cemeteries are full of people who have experienced physical death. But that's not what Romans 6.23 is talking about. It's talking about spiritual death, which is eternal separation from God and hell. Let me tell you three quick things about hell. It's a place of fire. How many of you burned yourselves and enjoyed it? Why would a loving God send anybody to a place of fire? First of all, he doesn't send you. You choose to go. Second of all, if you're a miner and you're extracting iron ore or silver ore or gold out of the ground and you want to purify it, what do you apply to it? If there's dirty water, you need to drink it, what do you apply to it? Fire, you boil it. See, fire purifies. So if you think about it, the lost sinner going to hell, fire makes perfect sense. The problem is, the purification process lasts forever. There's no end. Hell is also a place of darkness. Have you ever been in a power outage? Lights go out like that and you can't see your hand in front of your face? What's the first emotion that comes over you? What's the first thing you want to see? Imagine a place that's dark and will never be light. Jesus is the light in heaven. He's not going to be... His presence isn't going to be in hell. Somebody would object and say, well, first you tell me hell is going to be fire, and then you tell me it's going to be dark. That's a contradiction. When I light a match, the darkness flees. Well, scientists have concluded that the color of the hottest fire that could possibly burn is pitch black. Think of the black holes in outer space. See, the God that created the universe wrote this book, There Are No Contradictions. You may be ignorant, but that doesn't make God a contradictor, all right? 
But the worst part of hell is not the fire and the darkness, as bad as that will be. The worst part of hell is this. For the first time in your existence, you will be completely, utterly separated from the presence of Almighty God. You know, the Bible says God is spirit. He's everywhere present. He's with you and me right now. He's with the Chinese Christians. And because you're alive in God's presence, there's a certain sense of, of peace and security and comfort we could not otherwise have apart from his presence. And when you die in your sins and go to hell, that's gone. Think of the most terrifying, sad, horrific day of your life. That would seem like a good time compared to how you will feel when you enter hell. With the knowledge, you will never leave. It's horrifying to contemplate, but it's truth. And by the way, if more Christians really believed this, they'd be out there telling their friends and neighbors and co-workers about Christ. I can't think of anybody I would want to go to hell, let alone somebody I know and love. So because we're sinners, we're going to be damned to hell. But the second part of Romans 6.23 says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and therein lies the hope. A gift is free. You don't have to pay for a gift. And what is that gift? Eternal life. That's talking about a home in heaven with God forever. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> John 3.16, of course, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God the Father, hath made him God the Son. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now listen. <clears throat> Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to turn around. See, when we're in our, our sin and rebellion against God, the Lord says, repent. Turn from that hard attitude. And turn to Jesus Christ for your salvation. And when you, when you do that, God will take your sins, this verse is telling us this, He'll take your sins, He'll nail them to the cross with Jesus. He'll take the righteousness and holiness of Christ and he'll place it on you. It's called an imputed righteousness. It's a legal term, folks. It, it means you're not righteous in and of yourself, but because of your faith in Christ, God declares you legally righteous. So when you stand before the judgment seat someday, you will be innocent because of the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. But as many as received him, Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about you? If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, would you pray tonight and receive him? You say, Brother Dan, I don't know how to pray and receive Christ. Let me, let me give you a, a, a sample prayer. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I know I deserve to go to hell. And I know my good works can't save me. But I believe Jesus Christ is God the Son, that he became a man, lived the perfect life, I believe he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay my sin debt in full. I believe he was buried and rose again the third day, proving he is God and what he said is true. Lord, I'm sorry for my rebellion against you and your law. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Savior. Thank you for saving me and taking me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a model prayer. We call it the sinner's prayer. I'm going to pray that prayer in just a moment. I'm going to go much more slowly, so if you'd like to pray that prayer with me, you can say it after, after I do. Little by little, we'll, go through, we'll walk through this prayer. You can say it out loud. The other Christians in the room would love to hear you coming to Christ. Or you can say it in your heart. God hears your thoughts. But I want you to know two things about that prayer. Number one, you could pray it a million times and still die and go to hell. Why? Because a prayer can't save you. Your faith in Christ is what saves you. The prayer is simply a way to communicate your faith to God. And it'll be a good concrete thing you can point back to and remember the day you prayed and received Jesus. So number one, don't pray that prayer if you don't mean it. And number two, you know, don't pray that prayer if you, if you have no desire in your heart to be saved. This is, only, this, is, this, is a, this is a prayer only for those who have never prayed to receive Christ. Okay? And, and you can pray it a million times till die and go to hell. Your faith saves you, not the prayer. Second of all, if you're already a Christian, you cannot pray this prayer. I'll say it again. 
If you are already a Christian, you cannot pray this prayer. Why? Because after you receive Christ as your Savior, you are no longer a sinner, you're a saint. This is not the saint's prayer. That's 1 John 1, 9. This is the sinner's prayer. That's this, in other words, it's only for those who have never accepted Christ as their Savior. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. I'd like to bow your head and close your eyes, please. <clears throat> Heads bowed and eyes closed. If, and we're not done the message yet. I have, I'm going to close with a few more comments. But if you have never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you want to do that tonight, then I invite you to, lead, to pray this prayer with me now. I'm going to lead you in prayer. Here we go. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to heaven. I know my good works cannot save me. But I believe Jesus Christ is God the Son. I believe he became a man. He lived the perfect life. He never sinned. I believe he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay my sin debt in full. I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day, proving he is God and what he said is true. Lord, I'm sorry for my rebellion against you and your law. Forgive me of my sins. I invite you now into my life to be my personal Savior. Thank you for saving me and taking me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a few more minutes. I have a couple more things I need to do here. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you just prayed and asked Jesus to save you, if you just prayed that prayer with me, I want to ask God to bless your new walk with Christ. I'll not point you out, but I need to know who you are. With nobody looking around, would you slip up your hand for me if you just prayed to receive Jesus? Anybody at all? Did anybody pray? I see one hand there. Okay, I see another hand. Raise your hand. Keep them up. Both, please keep your hands up, folks, so I can see. Okay, I see two hands that were raised. These two people said that they received Christ. Praise the Lord. Hands down. I'm going to pray for these folks, but please... Remain in this position, heads bowed and eyes closed. Lord, you saw the hands that went up. I ask you to bless these two, their walk with Christ. Help them to read their Bible every day. That's how you talk to them. Help them to pray every day. That's how they talk to you. And I pray they will both come forward and make a public profession of faith and share with the rest of us so that we can celebrate two new Christians, two people going to heaven. And we will we, we'll praise you for this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask another question. If you're a Christian here tonight... You're a Christian, you're already saved, and you say, Brother Dan, this message, God used this message to prick my heart. Some of these devilisms have impacted me and my family, and I want to yield more of my life to Christ. I want to rededicate my life to Christ. With nobody looking around, would you slip up your hand? I want to ask God to bless your, your commitment. I see one hand there. Anybody else? I see another hand, two more hands. Several have raised their hands. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Father, you saw the hands of these Christians. They, they, Lord, have listened to this message. Your spirit has spoken in their hearts. And they want to be more devoted and dedicated to Christ. They want to rededicate their lives to you. Honor them, Father, and bless them. Give them the courage and the power of the Holy Spirit to live their life for you, Lord. And I'll give you the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we covered a lot of important concepts today. I, want to, I would encourage you to do more research on these devilisms and learn more about how Satan is using these to destroy our nation. And it's up to us to stand in the gap. We're Daniel Charlotte Ministries, Reaching America for Christ. Will you pray and give so we can go? Thank you, Brother Charlie. Those of you that prayed the sinner's prayer, ask the Lord to come into your heart. You need to... You need to make a profession. He said, he that confesses me before men, I will confess my father, before my father in heaven. So I'm just going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a real short uh, one verse of song. And if you want to come, you can come now. If you feel that you don't yet want to do that, if you want to talk to me later, I'll be around. So you do that, okay? Have, have you got, I, I can't see.
Have you got what we're doing? Page 308. Page number 308 in your songbook. If you want to just turn it, we'll just sing one verse. Mean business if you want to come. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender. Thank you very much. Let's bow our heads in a prayer before we're dismissed tonight. Then you can come forward and look at the display if you want, okay? Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for the message. Father, we pray that we as Christians, Lord, might take our stand. And, Lord, we might live in accordance with your word. And that, Lord, that you might be able to direct us and guide us and give us the strength to do that. We love you, Lord. Bless those that made it... Uh, profession of faith tonight. Bless those that raised their hands that they wanted to rededicate their life. Father, I just pray that you would work mightily in the hearts of Harvest Baptist Church. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening now. Lord bless you. Thank you, sir.